Welcome to the Make It Happen with Will Polston podcast. These podcast episodes with Will and his guests provide you with insights on how you can transform your excuses into results to benefit yourself, your family, your friends, your community, society, humanity, and the universe with what Will calls the ripple effect. Will's mission is to empower one billion people via the ripple effect and intends that you'll become another person to add to the count having listened to this episode. Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston. This is episode number 107. And in this episode, I'm joined by the king of routine, John Lamerton. John is a serial entrepreneur, investor and author who's launched over 60 businesses and still works less than 20 hours a week. He's just a normal bloke from Plymouth and he's managed to attract more success than he ever dreamed of and he's done it by turning consistency into being his superpower and becoming a routine machine. He's a self-styled lazy entrepreneur that's managed to leverage the amazing power of daily habits and routines to be able to make success inevitable. And in this episode, he'll be showing us how we can do the same as we talk about becoming a routine machine. So John, welcome to the show. Kill, thank you, Will. Thank you very much for having me. So this is the first time that we've had royalty on the show. <laughs> this I, I should like sort of bow down and, 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 and sort of we're, we're not worthy. We have the king of routine on king the show. Routine. Well, I should have worn my T-shirt, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the king of routine. Well, look, we're, we're going to be talking about routine machine. Um, I've listened to it. I love it. You and I are very, very similar. In fact, I've, I've been told by many, many people um, that, uh, Will, you're like a robot, you know, and, and and I don't think it's in the way that I talk, but I think it's because I'm so process driven. And if I just kind of set my mind something, then that just becomes the routine. And I was really laughing when I was reading your book. We'll talk about it, about your your, your morning routine with the, the kids and the school routine and all the rest of it. It's, it's hilarious. We're going we're gonna to come to that uh, shortly. But king of routine, where has that come from? For everybody that's that's wondering what the hell we're talking about. So that was a couple of years ago. I wrote my first book, uh, Big Ideas for Small Businesses. It's kind of my my blueprint for running what I call an ambitious lifestyle business. And I was I was doing the rounds and I was doing podcasts. And I was on this uh, this podcast with an American um, chap called Jeff Woods for the One Thing podcast. One Thing, by the way, is my favourite personal development book of all time. Um, if you're only going to read three books, let's make it Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Tribe of Mentors. No, not Tribe of Mentors, Tools of Titans and The One Thing. So I'm on The One Thing podcast and Jeff Woods is, is drilling into me. Like I've, I've never been interrogated. I'm sorry, Will, but you're, we're having far too friendly a chat here. <laughs> Jeff Woods, we're only a couple of minutes in, John. It could, I'm going to turn the screw. Yeah, Jeff Woods had the spotlight in my face and he was grilling me into, so what exactly is it that you do? So what do you do on a daily basis? So, okay, let, when you land at your desk in the morning, what is the first thing you do? Okay, why do you do that? What do you do next? Okay, so this business that you grew over here, how did you do that? Okay, well, what did you do on a, on a weekly basis? How, how do you structure your weeks? And he just kept drilling down into, what do you do? What do you do every month? What do you do every quarter? What do you do once a year? What do you do five times a year? What do you do on the third, third Tuesday of every month? And then we'd finished recording and I was like, Whew. and all of a sudden he became super friendly. He's like, cool, well, I finished interrogating you. And he just, as this complete aside, he just said to me, routines are really important to you, aren't they? You're like the king of routine. And I was like, king of routine. Oh, oh, I'm having that. So I came back and mentioned it to my, my 1% club, my, my kind of group coaching platform. And I said, like, I've, just, I've just been called the king of routine. A few days later, this package arrived in the mail. I'm like, what the hell is this? I haven't ordered anything, opened it up. And it, it's a t-shirt <laughs> and this t-shirt had in the style of my first book mm. so exactly that colors and everything like that it had the words king of routine with a little crown on top emblazoned on it and i was just absolutely chuffed to pieces now when i launched that first book i stood on stage at the press launch so i had all the press assembled there we did a live podcast we hired out a yacht club, we had canapes, there was hundreds and hundreds of people there. 
And one of the journalists said to me, John, are you going to write a follow up book? And I said, I am never writing another book again. <laughs> Not a chance. This bloody book has nearly killed me. I haven't seen my family for months. I've been locked away in a darkened room, like editing line by line. This is horrible. I'm never doing it again. Jeff Woods calls me the king of routine, tells me how important routines have been to me. And you know that, that Steve Jobs quote about you can only connect the dots going backwards. Mm. Well, suddenly I sat there going, routine is really important to me. Oh my God. Every time I've had some success, it's come from me deliberately putting a routine in place or sometimes mm. accidentally finding a routine that works for me. Every time I've struggled, I've not had a routine. I've tried oh, yeah. to, I've been winging it. <laughs> That's one of my least favorite things is winging it. So I thought, do you know what? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go on holiday and I'm gonna take my little journal with me. And I've still actually got this journal on my desk here today. Um, and I said, if I can write, I think it was two pages. If I, if I can write two pages of notes just about routines, I will write another book. Yeah. And so I sent the kids off to the pool, sat down there with a cappuccino, opened up my journal and just started brain dumping. Just everything I knew about routines, everything I knew about habits, everything that had worked for me, everything that I could connect those dots going backwards and say, that was routine that did that. And yeah, that was routine that, or lack of routine that did that. And I ended up with 10 pages of notes. <laughs> So I, I think I went back up to the hotel room. I did a Facebook live and I just went, do you know what, guys? I'm writing another, another book. <laughs> I know I said I never would. That was the basis of it. And that was it. That was the, I, I felt, and this is where I am now. I'm just about to launch my third book. I've got books four, five, and six already planned. When I've got enough to say is when I will write another book. And at the moment, I've just got too much to say. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Okay, I love it. Well, look, um, what, one of my favourite quotes, and, and I think this ties in re really nicely, um, and it's actually the, the famous Ray Lewis quote, which is, greatness is a lot of small things done well, day after day, workout after workout, obedience after obedience, day after day. And that's the premise of, of what you're talking about, which, we, which we're going to get stuck into with, uh, with routine machine. Because look, it's, it's fair to say, you've had some fairly substantial success. I mean, you've now written two books. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, you've had over 60 businesses or you have, I mean, I don't, I don't think you've got them all now, right? But you've, you've, you've had over 60 businesses. Um, there, there's a lot of things that you have crammed into your day. And like a lot of, I'm sure you've been asked this question a million times when people say to you, how do you get so much done? Because there's every single person on the planet only has 24 hours in a day, seven days yeah. in a week. Yet you managed to get so much done. And I know that you put a lot of this, this down to routine, which is, which is what we're going to get stuck into. But can, can we kind of go back? Because one of the things that I always find fascinating, mm. I, I'm really curious, right? And from, uh, from being about 12 years old, one of the things I've become obsessed with is learning from successful people, what they do, why they do it, how they do it, and... In, in all different walks of life, from professional athletes to business people to all, all manner of different people from all different walks of life. So let, if we can go sort of way back, I mean, what, what did John Lamerton want to be when he was a, a, a kid? Um, and what's your journey, sort of the, the, the brief version from kind of teenager to kind of that, that pivotal moment that was the trajectory where you really sort of took off um yeah I'd, I'd love to know that cool i will try and keep this under 45 minutes <laughs> <laughs> so when i was i don't know let's say 14 maybe 15 i took a careers test at school so there's you fill in this questionnaire do you prefer x y or z you know do you are you process driven are you creative everything like that and it they put this into a computer it spits out jobs that you might be interested in and the jobs that it came up with me were judge uh, i do like to judge people uh, bank manager i do like to play with finance and marketing and marketing was the one that really really sang to me it's like oh i love the idea of marketing so i spoke to my careers teacher and said marketing that's the one for me and my careers teacher said 
well, you can't do that in Plymouth. Um, the, we don't do marketing in Plymouth. Uh, if you want to do marketing, you have to move to London. And I went, oh, well, I don't really want to move to London. Okay, then, well, I'll go for it. And I chose the bank manager route. So I couldn't get into a bank. So I ended up in the civil service, which was the next thing to a, and you know, any of, of our generation will have heard, safe, secure, job for life, good pension. Those were the criteria that our parents set us <laughs> for the career we should go on. So, okay, I'll go down the civil service route. Six and a half years, I did the civil service route. I settled into a job I pretty much enjoyed. Um, I had autonomy within my job. I did have some set routines that I did every single day within the job. Lots of routine in the civil service. But one day, my job was regraded within the civil service and I was moved to a different different department doing a job I absolutely hated. And I started this new job on the, I think it was the 10th of July. Three weeks later, whilst still on the opening induction training course, I launched my online marketing business. <laughs> so this was the early 2000s press was full of Brent Hobeman, Martha Lane Fox. Uh, Google hadn't even been heard of by then. Mark Zuckerberg, don't even know who he is. So it was full of these internet, like early 20 something year olds having ideas. Crucially, not making any money. They were just having ideas and someone would throw millions and millions of pounds at them. So I thought, I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna launch an internet marketing company. Three problems with that. Uh, number one, I've never run a company before. Uh, number two, I know nothing about marketing. And number three, I don't even own a computer, let alone have access to the internet. So other than those... So you're three, up against it. <laughs> well, slightly, you know. So, but crucially, I think I knew that I knew nothing. Mm. So the first thing I did was I borrowed my girlfriend's computer and their dial-up internet connection. They're, they're thankfully um, my wife and now my, my in-laws. And I got myself a copy of Internet Marketing for Dummies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so pretty much I read that book and I followed the instructions. I went through it step by step by step. And when I got stuck on a step, I just, I reached out and I found some people who were 18 months, 12 months even, ahead of me on the journey. And they were doing what I wanted to do. So I knew it was possible. I just knew that I didn't know how to do it yet. And I kept persevering. Um, it's a trait I think we hear again and again. The reason I persevered was my very, very strong desire to leave the day job. Because what I was doing wasn't working. Um, in my first book, I talked about like my first paycheck. And my first check arrived after nine months of running my business on top of the day job. So that's probably two hours a day, plus every weekend, plus probably a couple of weeks of annual leave. And maybe, I don't know if there's anyone from the civil service listening here, but maybe a few sick days might have been taken <laughs> when I wanted to do a launch or get the new website ready. So nine months of work, and my first check was for 13 pounds and 51 pence. And to this day, uh, my biggest regret is that I cashed that check mm. because I would love to be looking at that check on my wall right now because that was the moment that I knew this is gonna work because it's only 13 pounds and 51 pence, but I have generated that check, that money, out of thin air, out of nothing but my creations. I've, yes, it probably, I've probably spent, you know, I don't know, 1500 pounds on computers, internet, um, book. I'd probably invested 700 hours for that 13 pound, 51 pence, but I knew it could work. Yeah. So from there, two months later, I was earning kind of 13 pound, 51 pence a week and then 13 pound 51 pence a day 
And then eventually I got it to the point where I was could earn £13.51 an hour. And then it was goodbye day job. Yeah, yeah. Hello, running businesses. Yeah, I love it. I, I, there's two things I want to pick up on here, which mm. I, I think are really interesting. So I was at a conference recently and they described the marketing as creativity and maths, which I thought was quite interesting. Mm. Um, and uh, I, 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 I've, I've never heard it broken down like that, but I thought that was quite interesting. And knowing a little bit about marketing now, uh, I thought that was quite cool. Um, I'm definitely creative and I quite like maths. Um, so I suppose, yeah, I, I do like marketing. I think that the marketing is the the prospect of, of, of creation, you know, of what you can do in, in something that comes back. But the other thing that I think is really important. So when I, I've studied a lot of people that have gone on to achieve success, and of course, success is subjective, but go, go on and to do some cool things. And one of the things that you've said before is that you've attracted more success than you've ever dreamed of you know this guy from Plymouth that's attracted more success than he's ever dreamed of and one of the many things because there's lots of components but one of one of the things that I think is a fundamental is people do what they love mm. and what's really interesting was that when you were given those three options when you did this careers test um bank manager um judge judge or, um, or or doing marketing, you kind of connected the dots and had this this feeling, I suppose, your intuition or whatever else going, yeah, that that resonates with me. Mm. And then you pursued that path of doing the thing that you love, which is something that I think the majority of people actually don't do. Yeah. And then they, they find themselves actually pursuing a career that other people want them to do whether that be parents yeah. whether that be old school teachers even what society might deem them to to do and then they wonder it's like it's like trying to soar against the grain you know they wonder why they're never really making making momentum how important do you think that part of actually pursuing and finding out quite early you know if you're talking in your early 20s 18 early 20s of um identifying the thing that you loved and pursuing that has been how, how important of catalyst do you think that's been in in you um creating more success than you've ever dreamed of I, I think that's that's huge because ultimately that's what fuels the desire to keep going mm. no six-year-old seven-year-old says daddy when i grow up i want to be a civil servant <laughs> You never hear that. Astronaut, train driver, you know. I'm going to, what's this, again, I'm quoting lots of Steve Jobs here, putting a dent in the universe. That's what kids want to do. That's what they're passionate about. I'm, mm. my eldest is 12 now. So we're having these conversations about what do you want to do? And I went through a careers test with him about two weeks ago. And he's very, very creative. So some of the stuff we came up with were around creative arts and it suggested lots of different jobs to him oh yeah yeah that'd be interesting yeah yeah okay that's good animator oh 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 yeah yeah i'd love to do that what you mean i could make like south park and, and like the simpsons oh that would be fantastic oh my god yeah i think what i could do with that and just seeing instantly he's coming up with ideas about what he could do rather than and none of it is Excuse me, Daddy, but how much does an animator pay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was nothing yeah. about well, how much am I going to earn if I do this? It's just oh, I would love to spend my days doing that, and you're going to spend most of your life doing what it is that you do for a career. So why not choose what you love? And I think I, I've always classed myself as an investor as well as an entrepreneur. So. I've always said to my kids, I said they're only like 12 and 9 now, but I've said to them from day dot, do what you love. Businesses exist to solve problems. So think of the problem that you, A, can solve better than anyone else, and B, absolutely love to solve. Mm. If you can make a lot of money doing that, brilliant. If not, I will show you how to make money playing the stock market, investing in cryptocurrencies, whatever. I, you can have an investment plan that guarantees if you put, you know, no matter what you do, if you're a civil servant and you're on, I, mean, I was on bloody 15 grand a year um, many, many years ago. But if I put away 20% of everything I earn for four decades, I'm going to be very, very wealthy in my retirement. Mm. And 
I will happily show my kids that don't worry too much about making money, making a lot of money. You need to have a viable business. It's no good just saying I'm going to make cupcakes in my kitchen uh, for minimum wage or below minimum wage as many business owners will. You can create wealth long term through investment and do what you love i, I want to touch on this as well because it, it, it's a perfect i wasn't actually going to bring it up but I, I quite often get asked on interviews if you could go back and tell your 15 year old self one thing what would you tell them and the one thing that i would actually tell myself and i i, I tried to install this to my baby sister who's not so much of a baby anymore she's 21 um maybe even 22 i'm not sure 21 i think um and it would actually be to have saved 10 percent of everything i ever earned that's all because what what the the the, the, the t- typical thing that i got taught when i was younger was save your money and i it was my dad telling me but it was there was no reason it wasn't explained to me why yeah. to save in my head saving meant losing out on what i could have today yeah. rather than gaining what i could have tomorrow and w- when you do the compound effect and you know the, the power of compounding oh, yeah. extremely well the i mean albert einstein called compounding the eighth wonder of the world you know and he was a pretty smart guy the, the compound effect of what compounding can do it is scary when we think of that and that's the one thing if i could go back and tell because I, I was i was ducking and diving and sort of I was like the Dell boy at school from 12, 13 years old. If I'd have saved 10% of everything I'd earned, the, the, the wealth I would have now from just doing that. And I know that um, Warren Buffett is a, 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 you're, you're a, 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 has been someone that you've looked up to for many years and him and Charlie Munger and what they've done by just compounding. And you talk a lot about snowballing. Um, so before, again, before we get into there's so much we can talk about here. I know, I'm glad that we've got a little bit of extra time, Joel, because we could we could be talking for hours and hours, I'm sure. But um, let, let's just talk about snowballing for people whilst we're on the topic of money. And then we are going to get stuck into routines and, and how to set them and, and the importance of routines. Definitely. I, I'm a big, big Buffett head. Um, so again, most most teenagers had kind of Ferraris, Lamborghinis and girl with tennis ball on their walls. I had the FTSE 250 in quotes from Warren Buffett. (laughs) So I've (laughs) always been investment focused. And Warren Buffett says investment is spending money today in the anticipation of more money in the future. That's all investment is. It's spending 10 pounds today, 100 pounds, 100,000 pounds today in the hope, in the anticipation, in the calculated anticipation of turning £10 into £20, £100 into £200 in the future. So the way Warren Buffett explains compounding is, I just love this analogy. So he said, imagine you're standing at the top of a massive hill and this hill represents your life. It represents time. The longer the hill, the longer your lifetime and you're stood at the top of this hill and it's gently snowing and you just get a few of those snowflakes in the palm of your hand and you just form them into that little snowball now that's that's your seed investment that's what you're starting with that's your 10 percent of your salary every single month that's almost like a like a routine there you go you get your first <laughs> instance of the routine bell and every month that you continue to do that and that is as simple as setting up a monthly standing order a monthly direct debit um, letting your employer know you'd like to make additional pension contributions whatever that looks like every single month you add a little bit more snow until eventually you've got let's say a golf ball sized snowball and then you lay that on the ground and you gently push it down the hill now if you never add any more snow to it that snowball will still gently roll down the hill of time, picking up additional snow as it goes. That is the interest on your interest. And eventually at the bottom of the hill, you will end up with a rather large snowball. You start with a little golf ball and you finish with, I don't know, what's a large sphere? (laughs) Let's say, uh, I don't know. uh, Yeah, like one of those massive Zorbs or the Eden Mm. Project, Mm. one of those. However, if you also have the routine in place of the 10% every single month that you're 
not only using the hill of time, but you're also adding to that snowball every single month for a long period of time. Well, actually, you're, you start with the golf ball and you end up with Jupiter. Mm. Um, I'm homeschooling my, my daughter at the moment. And we learned the other day that Jupiter is incomprehensibly big. It is 320 times the size of Earth. Wow. I can't picture what that looks like. That is how big your snowball can be if you start early enough. And there's, I'm, I've not got numbers in front of me now, but there are data along the lines of if you start age 16 and you put in 10,000 a year or 1,000 a year, let's say 1,000 pounds a year, and you do that up to age 30 and then you stop and you never put any more money in and you compound that, you just use the hill of time until you're 60, you will have more money than the person who starts at 40 and keeps putting in for 20 years and compounding because the hill of time does all the work. And that's yeah. what I love about Snowball. And that's why if I look at my phone here, I have no social media apps on here, but the front page has a compound interest calculator. Yeah, it's, it's so powerful. I, I remember, so I used to work in sales and arguably I still work in sales. Um, if, if we're in business, we're all in sales, right? But um, I, 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 and when I had my, um, I, I've done this training with lots and lots of people now, but I, I did, used to do the training with the guys. And I would say, how possible do you think it is to double the sales that you do in 12 months from now? And the majority would normally say, I can't do that. That's that's too difficult in, in, in 12 months, in one year to double their sales. But then I asked them the same question. I said, how possible do you think it is to do 10% more sales per month? Mm -hmm. And in almost every instance, it was a unanimous, everyone going, yeah, well, you could do that, no problem. Yeah. And then I explained to them, if they compounded that and they did 10% more every month, that's 313 percent increase in a year so yeah. that what they thought they couldn't do which was a hundred percent increase in a year by doing 10 percent every month for 12 months was a th over a 300 percent return and yeah. most times just blew people's minds and when they did the numbers there it was like oh my god i need to do this um so yeah it's, it's extremely powerful and uh hence why i know you're a huge advocate of, of sort of one percent increases and we, we won't go into it now but the whole dave browsford thing of, of yeah. what he did with the, Danes, yeah. with the olympic team it's, it's just it's just incredible so what let, let's talk about routine then so for you how do you define what a routine is so for me a routine is something that you do automatically almost without thinking and to begin with i think some of your routines will be deliberate but everybody already has routines and i speak to people quite often people say to me i i don't i don't have any routines and i say to them okay so think back to this morning when you got dressed which trouser leg did you put into your trousers first how about yesterday how about the day before how about the day before that and they go, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, which tooth did you clean first this morning? Followed by which tooth? Oh, okay, yeah, I get that. Okay, those are automatic scripts mm. that you're running. And I um, imagine many of your listeners will have heard the chimp paradox, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Steve Peters. So he talks about the human, the chimp, and the computer as the three parts of your brain. So for me, routines are the computer part of the brain. They are an automatic script that you run routines I, I i like to say that i outsource the stuff that matters to my routines because if i want long-term financial success i'll outsource that to maxing out my isa and having a, a direct debit for my pension contributions and having a, a quarterly review and having a, an annual sit down with a financial advisor and doing rebalancing every six months those are the routines that I know if I outsource everything to that for 40 years, I'm going to end up with significant wealth. Mm. What I used to do was read the papers, look at the financial pages, read ADFN, read financial blogs, 
look at the markets, analyze the markets, see what's going up, see what's going down, react. And what I ended up doing was being a busy fool until for some reason something happened in 2008 that really scared me out of trading the financial markets. And I now outsource everything to that routine. So the computer handles the routine. It's the script that the computer runs. The only question then, thinking back again to Dr. Steve Peters' Chimp Paradox, is who wrote that script? Was mm. it the human with his nice, logical, um, thought-through reasoning, taking very good care of future you? Or was it the chimp who really, really fancies a McDonald's right now mm. and thinks that it would be a really good idea to just look at Reddit threads at 3 a.m.? <laughs> And can I just scroll Facebook for five more minutes, please? And I'm just going to hit the snooze button. Those are the routines that the chimp has automatically created. And it's the reason why you automatically go to the McDonald's drive through on the way back from the gym. Because you sit there and you go, how did I end up here? It's the reason yeah. you suddenly look up and realize you've lost two hours scrolling the internet because it's an automatic script so all we're looking to do is notice the scripts to begin with and then just label them that one's written by a chimp that one's written by a human yeah and we're looking to shift the balance more human less chimp i love it i so what one of the things so you you call it routine some people mm. call it habits i call it patterns you know mm. one of the things i've become obsessed with is is, is becoming aware of patterns. What are people's patterns of thinking, patterns of behavior, mm. patterns of awareness? And that first step is the awareness piece. Because once you're aware, then you can make a conscious decision as to whether you change it or not. Like, is this yeah. serving me? Is it not? And there's so much that we do that we don't know that we don't know about. You know, I, I talk a lot about all possible knowledge. And most people think that this all possible knowledge is information they know and information they don't know. Mm. But that's not all possible knowledge. You've got information that you know that you know you're aware of it is information that you know that you don't know so yeah. you're conscious that you don't know about it but the majority of information out there these where, where these routines are held a lot of them is information you don't know that you don't know you just aren't aware of the things that you're doing um and, and and this is a lot of the work that you do in getting people i said the work you do in your book which is a fantastic book which i highly recommend everyone reads um routine machine is to is to become aware of those and then make the conscious decision to change, whether that's improving your family life, improving your health, improving your, um, your, 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 your finances, improving growth in your business. It's, it's this element of routine that you can change because you, you, I mean, we spoke a lot about business, but you applied this in your health and, and lost quite a lot of weight, right? Oh God. Yeah. Five stone um, over the course of probably a couple of years. But yeah, all of that came from routines. And one of the things I, I think I made, kind of I used in the book to ex explain where a lot of people go wrong with routines is I sorted my health out one habit, one routine at a time. I used to be a chain smoking, um, lager swilling, uh, fast food junkie and it just it was you know I, I was I never went to the gym I barely left the house I, I ate terribly I smoked I drank I did no exercise um, I had no uh, mental fitness routines I nothing I'd, I'd pull all-nighters I would neglect my sleep everything so what I didn't do was wake up one day tear up the fags give up drinking uh, go to the gym, run a marathon, uh, drink a load of water, sit in a sauna and meditate. If I had done that, I'd have lasted three days and I'd have gone, this is horrible. <laughs> I really don't like the way I feel. So I started and I think one of the first things I did was I cut out the smoking. Okay, that's that's the most dangerous one. That's the most chimp routine I've got that I know the human goes, okay, you know it's going to kill you. You know it's really expensive. You know there's no logical reason. There's no health benefits whatsoever in you doing this. There is no good reason you're doing this. Okay, that one's got to go first. Beyond that, well, let's replace some of the takeaways with proper food. 
there were still no very few, very few vegetables at this point. But let's let's take the I don't know, chicken tikka masala, fish uh, fish and chips, or you know Chinese takeaway, and let's replace that with just a home cooked shepherd's pie or something like that. Mm. Let's go and walk the dog. Um, let's join a gym. Let's actually go to the gym after joining the gym. Um, let's give up drinking. Let's start juicing vegetable juices. Let's start running 10Ks. Um, let's start doing HIIT workouts. Let's start having a daily sauna. Let's start a meditation practice. And all of this built. And again, I'm doing the snowball action here. But just, just to be clear, though, this is the, the, these weren't all the ideas you thought were straight away. These are things that you've yeah. gradually, over a course period of time have introduced it's not just well yeah. everyone's going well, well he, 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 i mean you've gone from zero to 100 but this is over a period <laughs> exactly. of time that you've done this and made those incremental gains right absolutely absolutely it's all about that period of time and it's it's changing one thing and then getting that positive feedback and this is where mm. routines either stick or they don't the reason that you can you have bad routines is because you get instant positive feedback from bad routines. If I if I go to let's say five guys today and I have a salted caramel, malted milk, coffee and chocolate milkshake, I will get instant feedback that this tastes delicious and it is <laughs> fantastic and the endorphins that flow through my body say John that was a good decision. Well done, you. Now, if I do that every day, I'm going to be a fat person. <laughs> and I'm not wanting to do that. But I get the instant feedback. So bad routines tend to give you instant positive feedback, but long term negative feedback. Yeah, the so good short, routines, short term, short term gain, long term pain, right? Yeah, the good routines are flipped. So actually, the good routines give you instant negative feedback. I'm talking to you, cold showers. Mm. <laughs> I'm talking to you, getting up at 4 a.m. and deciding to go out for a run. That feels horrible immediately. So you go, I'm not doing that again. But if you do that, if you get up at 4 a.m. every day and you go for a run after six months, all of a sudden you're like, wow, where did those three stone go? Mm. Where have these muscles come from? Why have I suddenly got full of energy? And you've got the, um, the positive correlation long term. You don't get yeah. the positive feedback until later on. So we need to trick the brain a little bit with yeah. some short term rewards for taking the good action. That could just be, you know, I mean, I, I'm a big advocate of sticker charts. Uh, get the streak going. One of our, one of our clients, he's got an Apple Watch and he's, he said, I'm up to 283 days now of closing the rings. And he's like, I can't stop that, that, um, that streak. Whatever routine you wanna do, if it's gonna be hard, let's say cold showers, cause that is, I do, I, I struggle with cold showers. Make it to five days and you get a treat. That could just be, I don't know, you get to go to Starbucks. It's not gonna serve you long-term, but it's, it's a five-day treat. Once you get to day 30, perhaps that's, I don't know, a night out of the cinema. Day 100, that's a meal at your favorite restaurant. One year, that's a weekend away somewhere. Five years, that's a holiday. Mm -hmm. And just create those rewards, start the streak, Create the rewards until, because people always say, how long does it take for a habit to become cemented and permanent? And I've used Mr. Bull from Peppa Pig in my examples. And Mr. Bull's answer to how long will it take to dig up the road is, it will take as long as it will take. Mm. Because if you've got a nice, easy routine that you're going to enjoy doing, and you put that in place, it's going to be pretty easy. It's going to be a couple of days, a couple of repetitions. You're there. Code showers, 
60, 70 days, I'm still trying. <laughs> still, yeah. I still need to physically override the computer. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk to that, though, because there's, there's two parts that I, I think are really important, right? And, and you just said the word easy there. Mm. And I'm a big believer that when you're looking to create a new pattern, new routine, new um, habit, whatever you want to label it as, it's make it easy. And I remember years ago, you talk about running and running early in the morning. Years ago, um, I was training for a charity boxing match. And one of the things that boxers we were advised to do because it was good for the reasons to go out running. The only time I could really do it was first thing in the morning. So I'd have stuff going on. So I was getting up at five o'clock when it was dark and it was frosty and it was like minus two degrees outside. And I never wanted to do it. Not once did I wake up and go, I can't wait to get out of my nice warm bed and get my running gear on and go running in minus two degrees in the pitch black. Yeah. Not once, but, I gave myself a get out clause. My get out clause was, Will, you only have to run for two minutes. Yeah. So I would literally, I would make it easy. So I would literally get, I would the night before, I would literally lay my socks and my running shorts and my top and my um, jumper thing and my woolly hat and my gloves on the floor like a like a you know when you see sort of in cartoons like the the, the, the dead person that's been rolled over <laughs> yeah. and it was like laid out there like if someone walked in they might have thought someone was there if they saw him in the dark of the night. Uh, and all I would ever say to myself is, well, you only have to run for two minutes. Yeah. Now, the reason I did that was because if I said, well, you've got to go and run 5K, I'd be like, oh, this will be hard. But the fact that I said I only have to run two minutes. Now, guess what? Once I got out and I would ran for two minutes, not once did I ever go back in because I've done the hardest part, which was start. And um, I, I think that's really key. But one of the things you talk about in the book, which I love, is the inverse of that. Because mm -hmm. lots of people always talk about, well, how do I start a new habit? And how do I do this? And how do I do that? But also you talk about how do you stop a bad habit? And you actually talk about that by doing the opposite of what I've just mentioned, which is by making it hard to start off with. So what's some examples of things that people could do to, uh, if they've got a habit that they don't want to do, that they could make it hard for themselves to, uh, to do that thing? Cool. So let, let's think about, I don't know, waking up first thing in the morning. So do you hit the snooze button? Okay. Why do you, why can you hit the snooze button? Because it's next to your bed. Let's move the alarm clock. So you have to get out of bed. That's one thing that immediately we've added a little bit of friction that makes it a little bit harder. The more friction you've got, the less you're able to do that thing. Um, you've also removed that visual clue. So again, if, if you do automatically go to McDonald's on the way home, drive a different route so you don't you, you it's a little bit of an override but you're just making it that little bit harder if mm. you want to get more steps in well let's get off the bus a little bit early so that again you've got that friction of well i can't just walk that short step i've got to do it the long way uh, and any other kind of thinking about like proper negative habits what negative habits would people want to break yeah, I suppose I, I often talk about the, the 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 chocolate one, for example, right? So I personally, I'm I, I've got a sweet tooth, right? And I, I love a bit of chocolate after for food uh, after dinner. And what what I used to do was I used to have chocolate in the house, and then I decided that I wanted to cut out eating chocolate after dinner. So I just got rid of all of the chocolate in the house. Yeah. Now, could could I have decided I really want chocolate? Um, right, I'm going to get out, I'm going to get in my car, I'm going to drive to the shop, go and buy chocolate, absolutely. Yeah. But the fact that I didn't have it there um, just was enough friction, as you put it. I yeah. also think the other thing, in my, my personal opinion, I'm not sure your, your, your view on this, is rather than always creating voids, is to create replacements. So, for example, what I actually did in those times was I, I removed the chocolate, but then rather than have this craving of like, I need something, well, what could I replace it with? So I ended up replacing it with, um, uh, depending on the times of when I used to do this, was yogurt, natural yogurt and honey. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit of honey and natural yogurt. And another time I used to do it with um, peanut butter rice cakes. Yes. So it was an alternative that was that just that little bit better, a bit like your examples of rather than having the, the Chinese takeaway, you have the shepherd's pie. Like what, what's just yeah. make that marginal gain that, that makes it easy? So, um, yeah, I think it's a, a really, really a, a great thing to do. And you talk about visual clues as well. And I think this is genius, you know. And so I, I, don't, I don't, have, you, have you ever studied NLP? 
A little bit, yes. Yeah. Okay. Of years. So in, in NLP, we have something called a swish pattern. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's a technique that you do with people when you want to change an image they have in their mind. Yeah. And um, uh, I've done it with many, many people with great success. But when I was listening to your book, I thought to myself, what a great thing to do. So let's say, for example, you've got the, um, uh, uh, let, let's say you've got kids, so you can't not have the chocolate in the house, in the chocolate cupboard that most of us have got. Yeah. And you, you, you're tempted to go to the chocolate cupboard. You could get a photo of you. If you don't like the way that you look, you get that photo of you with the, the, the belly hanging out and you make sort of the least glamorous photo you can find of what you've got. And you take that photo and you put that in the cupboard. Mm. So when you go to open the cupboard and you pick out the, the delicious bar of galaxy chocolate, you see that picture and it's just enough to make you go, yeah, I don't want to look like that on holiday next year. I, I'm, I'm smiling here because there is a photo on my fridge of fat me. And it is next <laughs> to the handle of the fridge. So every time I open the fridge, I, I just subconsciously glance and it's there. And every now and then I will just make better choices. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes I will see it, open the fridge, cheesecake. Lovely. Thank you very much. Come to daddy. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it is that little bit of a pattern interrupt to go, hello, chimps making a bit of a decision mm. here. You know, who's who's in charge? Um, apparently, uh, I only discovered this recently, it is actually physically impossible to eat ice cream that isn't in your freezer. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. So what, one of the other things that, when, when it comes to creating patterns and, and routines specifically, mm-hmm. creating new routines, people can go, yeah, but, but it's boring. <laughs> it's boring. So for, for the people that get bored with their routine, because they love variety, and a lot of people listening to this are entrepreneurial, they are business owners, they're go-getters, they, they almost it's almost like a, a prerequisite to just have this shiny penny syndrome of wanting, wanting to do something different and constantly have this variety. Yeah. What's your advice to those people that, that, that go, but it's boring, John? Routines more than anyone else because routines are the structure, the scaffolding around which everything else can be built. So if you put what you have to do the boring stuff that has to be done you know let's let's get the investments sorted and let's get the paperwork done and let's do the no no let's do the marketing if i don't like doing the marketing or let's put you know doing the bookkeeping in on the second wednesday of every month now i'm gonna i don't know if people will be watching the video as well the the people that are on youtube um, will be able to watch this so what I will describe as well what I'm showing here. So this is my weekly plan. Every Friday, as a routine, I fill in one of these for the following week. Now, this is my default plan here. So what you'll notice is that certain things are blocked out on here. This is all the stuff I have to do. So these are my recurring meetings. These are my homeschool sessions. And they're also my workouts. So my exercise routines are in here. My parenting routines are in here. All the school runs are in here. My team coaching is in here. And I've also got blocked out times here for what I've labeled deep work. So for me to do the creative work that I want to do, so that's a little bit of flexibility there to say, actually, you're you're not going to do anything else. No meetings, no calls are going in on these days. Those days are free for you to do what matters most to you. There's the creativity. And you'll also notice Friday, there is nothing. Mm. So that is, that's just a simple rule. Fridays are free. That's why we're chatting on a Friday is because I've always got Fridays free. Mm. That is a routine. That is the structure because I've crammed everything else in optimized completely for my energy levels and my life and everything around the kids and the family and health and everything that, that's all taken care of Monday to Thursday. Fridays are free. I can do whatever the hell I like on Friday because I've outsourced the important stuff to the routines. Yeah, very good, very good. So what, what I wanna talk about now, because it's, it, it is a big thing, 
um, for a lot of people. And I have a very strong opinion on it. And um, having listened to your book, I know you do too. I'm a big believer that if you win your morning, you win your day. And um, there's been a lot of books that have come out. I mean, uh, Miracle Morning and 5am Club. And, and, and there's a lot of things around morning routines. So um, what's your opinion on morning routines? Yeah, I, morning routines are so important. Um, because as you said, you beat the day. You How you things start tend to be how they carry on. So... I like to have, there's no better feeling than getting to 10.30 in the morning and my Fitbit buzzes to tell me I've done my 10,000 steps already. Um, the fact that we're recording this at 11 a.m. and I'm on something like my second liter of hydration. I've had my bulletproof coffee, so I've got my, nu I've got my nutrients in me. I'm hydrated, I've uh, exercised, I've done my best work of the day, and it's barely 11 a.m. So the rest of the day doesn't matter as much, but you've got momentum on your side. And I think that is what an optimized morning routine gives you is momentum. I see so many people who don't have that morning routine who just say, well, you know, my morning routine is I check my emails and I scroll social media and then I figure out what to do with my day. And then, well, it's 11 a.m. now. I I better have a chocolate bar because my energy levels are, dr are dropping. No, let's optimize it. One thing I absolutely advocate for, and I, I obviously reference Miracle Morning 5 a.m. Club just now, your morning routines do not have to start at 5 a.m. They do not have to involve kettlebells. They do not have to involve green smoothies. They absolutely can if you want them to. But the important thing is not what the morning routine looks like. It's not copying Jocko Willink's 4.30 or a.m. Alarm, alarm call and swinging kettlebells in his garage. No, it's about optimizing it for yourself. I, like many years before writing Routine Machine, I read Miracle Morning and I thought, oh, I like the sound of this. I knew, again, how important beating the day was. I thought, oh, I love the idea of getting up Actually, no, I don't like the idea of getting up early. I am mm -hmm. completely lying to you there. I do not like the idea of getting up early. I am very much, well, I used to be a proper night owl. Kids have kind of moved me more, what I would class as an in-betweener now, in terms of circadian rhythm. Um, but I liked the idea of, okay, you get up a little bit earlier than you'd like to, but you get to do exercise, you get to hydrate, you get to get some nutrients in you, you get to do some affirmations, you get to do some journaling, you get to read some personal development. But you, it's, it's like getting 90 minutes of me time every mm. morning. I love the sound of that. So sure enough, I set my alarm, I think I set it for something like 5.30. And thankfully on my Fitbit, I've got a silent alarm because the one thing you don't wanna do if you've got a house full of children and a wife who doesn't want to get up at 5.30 a.m., you don't want to wake everybody up. Mm. So my, my silent alarm goes off at 5.30. I tiptoe out of the bedroom. I've put my visual clues out there. So I've got my workout gear. So I put my workout gear on. And I think, okay, right, I'm going to start by doing a workout. Where can I do a workout that isn't going to make any noise? because I can't do it in this room because I'm going to wake up the wife. I can't do it upstairs because that'll wake the kids up. Oh, I can't, right, I can't, I can't do a workout. My God, it's freezing in this house, isn't it? Why is it so cold? Oh, it's because the heating doesn't come on at 5.30 in the morning. Okay, never mind. We'll go upstairs. We'll do some journaling. So I, I, where do I put the light on? So I very carefully put a side light on so there's not to wake the whole house up. And I start doing my journaling, but I can't see because the light's not bright enough. So I give that up as well. Like, that's a bad idea. I know what I'll do. I will make my green smoothie. So I go into the kitchen, at which point the dog wakes up and starts running around the house like, my husband, shh, 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 it's not time to get up yet. Just go back to sleep. Make my little smoothie, put, put all my chia seeds and my blueberries and my spinach in, nice bit of almond milk. Go to put it on the blender. I'm like, blender. I can't use a blender at 5.45 a.m. without waking the whole house up. Oh, 
So it just sits there like, oh, can't do that. Eventually, my wife did wake up and the kids did wake up. So everyone was up a little bit earlier than they wanted to be. And they're looking at me with daggers. What the hell have you done waking the whole bloody house up? So we're sat there, uh, I don't know, quarter to seven in the morning now, bleary eyed, low on energy, not, you know, barely talking to each other and saying, right, this isn't working. Get them all off to school, come back. I go back to bed. <laughs> so I'm back in bed by half past nine because I'm shattered. And that was because I followed someone else's routine. Mm -hmm. um, I've, sleep for me is so important. And we talk a lot about morning routines. I think evening routines and bedtime routines are as important as morning routines because how you end the day just flows straight into how you start the next day. If you mm -hmm. end the day with some relaxation, um, the same bedtime every night, bit, reading a bit of personal development or reading a bit of fiction, whatever helps you switch off and process the day you've just had, plus let's get your workout gear laid out for the day before. Let's make that green smoothie the night before and leave it in the fridge so that in the morning all you've got to do is drink it. Let's make things easy for the next day. Mm. That makes things so much more impactful, but it's not, and it's one thing I was very careful not to do in the book. I don't want to be prescriptive. I don't want to say, mm. well, this is the routine you need to do. This is what you, it's no, it's, it's a choose your own adventure book. The routine doesn't matter. What matters is that you have a routine that you have designed for you. I couldn't agree more. I think it doesn't matter what time you wake up, but it does matter what you do when you wake up. And yes. there, there's certain things. I mean, I, I regard it as self care. It's it's a it's a it's a form of time for self care, personal development, form of self care. You're filling your own jug up before you pour into anybody else's. Yeah. And it, it is having that time. And there'll be things that I do for a long period of time that are things that are embedded into my morning routine. And then I actually go. I don't really need to do that as much anymore. That's not as much of a priority. Yeah. So I'm going to park that and I replace it with something else. You mentioned sleep. This year I got a I got a whoop. I don't know if you've you've only said Fitbit, but I, I got yeah. a whoop. I don't know if you've come up with a whoop. And uh, yeah, or ring. And 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 I was amazed at how poor my sleep was, even though mm. typically I was getting seven seven and a half hours every night. So I've made shifts now yeah. in in my. So I, I maybe won't do, like this morning is a prime example. I was going to go to the gym this morning, but I ended up having a slightly later night than I was expecting. Yeah. And rather than go, right, well, it doesn't matter. You go to the gym, you sacrifice no matter what. I, I know the importance now for me operating at peak performance because that is one of my primary goals. And we do have to ask ourselves, what are we optimizing for? What's the primary yeah. goal? Because that will also determine what what our what our priorities are and um yeah it makes a, a big difference but um yeah m morning routines are, are are important what's one in fact i'm going to ask you a better question what are there's lots of routines as we've established even putting your right yeah. leg first into your, your your trousers what are three of your non-negotiable routines that you've had in 2021 which is the year that we've recorded this prioritizing sleep that's got to be number one um i read dr matthew walker's book why we sleep about book. two years ago and managed to royally annoy my wife um, because we were on holiday i was listening to it on um, audible and I just kept pausing it and saying, oh my God, you'll never guess what they said. Oh, they've done this study over in Sweden. Oh my God, did you know that when they put the school start times back, they stopped all the road traffic accidents? Did you know that every year when the clocks go forward, um, we, we all lose an hour's sleep and all of a sudden the cardiac um, department at the A&E is full? And it just kept saying all these things. So for me, everything I've done, and that's why I've got the aura ring, um, that's why I'm so focused on nighttime routines is because having a good quality night's sleep, not just amount of time in bed, but having good quality sleep, I've now noticed, and I've got two years worth of data 
from my aura ring now that I, I look, I go hunting for correlations. If I do a workout in the morning, how does that affect it versus me doing the workout in the evening or the afternoon? What happens on the days where I have an extra cup of coffee? What time can I have my last cup of coffee and it not affect my sleep? Um, I've just started playing now with an acupressure mat in the evening. So just 10 minutes on this mat. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, my deep sleep has just gone through the roof. So I'm just noticing all the routines I've got. How do they affect sleep? Because I know sleep is the one thing that affects everything. When If I'm going to make good decisions in my business, I need to be well rested. If I'm going to be healthy, I'm going to need to be well rested. If I'm going to be a good parent to my child, I need to be optimized and working efficiently. And that requires my computer to have been fully rebooted and formatted overnight. So without a doubt, that is, that's number one. And that's miles, miles above anything else. Yeah. Uh, number two is marketing the business. So that's one of the things that I discovered. And you mentioned the 60 businesses earlier. I used to do everything for every business. And I would just... How many businesses have you got now still? Though? So I, w I would say we've probably got... We've got one sports betting business, which is there's a couple of brands within that. And then we've got the 1% Club, which is the group coaching business. Um, there's some property investment stuff and kind of share trading stuff we do on, on top of that. But pretty much we've got the two main businesses, right, sports betting businesses, yeah. and small business coaching. So that was really, really focused and narrowed down from doing everything. And yeah, it was that was a game changer for me, was changing, instead of doing, building the website, emailing the members, doing customer support, uh, looking after social media, writing the press releases, dealing with suppliers, everything for every business and you know i i had very they weren't even in the same sector i did private villa rentals live football streaming mobile phone insurance it was serviced office rentals uh directory of online florists anything i could make money out of i i used to do Wait, question for you why did you do that so when i when i first started with leaving the civil service job i i would have an idea and I put a website up for that idea and it would start making money. So again, I had that fairly instant feedback. And yeah, so the in the very early feedback. days of Google, I could I could have an idea on the Monday, get a horrible looking website up by Tuesday and be number one on Google by Wednesday. Right, yeah. And I just started collecting and I, I'm, I'm a big fan of assets and I keep collecting assets. So for a period, I went out buying websites as well. So if someone had a website that generated uh, any, anywhere above £10,000 a year, I would go out and I would buy that website and I would just put it into the portfolio. Um, but yeah, eventually Google gave me a bit of a kicking and said, we're taking all your rankings away, we're taking all your traffic away. Um, this process that you've been doing for the last couple of years just doesn't work anymore. So I ended up having to focus and I focused on one business, which was the sports betting business because mm. Google took my rankings away, but I still had the mailing list. And this was the yeah. crucial thing for me. I had 14,000 people who wanted to hear from me every day. They wanted to get my emails. Mm. So I kept doing that. And then I thought, well, actually what I need to do for this business isn't writing the tips, updating the website, designing flyers, uh, you know, coding HTML and doing the horse racing tips. What I need to do is I need to be the marketer of this business and leaning into marketing. And instead of doing 12 different things for 60 different businesses, doing one thing for one business. And this is why the one thing is my number one yeah, book of all time is that focus on I just do marketing for the sports betting business so was it um when back then when you start to you, you said if it was making more than 10 grand you you'd take it on so was it financially driven the the, the decisions to have all those businesses were they was it financially driven it was I was I I was compounding so oh, yeah, yeah. I, and it was the return on the investment I could get from that was phenomenal 
So those. So let's say there was a website that was earning ten thousand. I could buy that for normally no more than two years revenue, so twenty thousand. Yeah. So if I buy and hold, I do nothing with that website. I'm getting fifty percent return on investment. Yeah. But I was doing things like conversion rate optimization. I was doing yeah, search engine. I, I, I was. Yeah, I was yeah. more. I was normally getting my money back within six months. Yeah. yeah. And then I still owned the asset. So I was just yeah, compounding yeah. all that. But yes, it financial driven completely. Um, yeah. I was in a vicious circle at the time of the people I hung around with were all, how many millions are we going to make? How, you know, who's going to get the biggest yacht? Who's going to have the helicopter first? Who's going to have the skyscraper with their name on the side? Mm. So that was how I was going to get there. I'd completely lost track of the fact that I was a civil servant on 15 grand a year and what I wanted to do was just not hate my job. Mm, yeah, no, of course. So, so the um, so sleep, marketing. What's the third? Third one is it's got to be health. Um, it's cause so many people, and I, 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 over lockdown, people said, "Oh, they've put on lockdown weight." Now, I, I went the opposite way. I haven't stepped in a gym since January twenty twenty. What I have done is I've put routines in place here. So I can look out of my window and I, I see my balcony. There are 13 steps to my balcony. So every Wednesday, I will run up and down those steps, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. And I will do three sets of 10. And I will be on my arse by the end of that. Um, I do that. I've got a punch bag in my garage. I bought some battle ropes. I bought a, a slam ball. And I walk every single day again i've used the data so i've got my aura ring i've also tracked my weight i've tracked my body fat percentage i've tracked my heart rate variability i've tracked my resting heart rate and i've looked at the data for two years over lockdown as well and i have noticed that the magic routine for me is walking so i've tracked all the data and when i have 60 minutes a day of elevated heart rates, not max heart rate, but probably 60 to 70% of max heart rate yeah. for an hour. That's a good long walk. Everything falls into place. My heart rate variability goes up. My resting heart rate goes down. My weight falls off me. Suddenly I've got more energy. I've got more clarity. I make better decisions with work, I get less stressed. Everything falls into place. So I showed my planner earlier and on here, I've got one workout, which is a hit workout and two walks. Those walks are 90 minute walks, which are in as an immovable object in my planner every single week. That's 90 minutes, no inputs. I normally, Every day I go out for a walk with the dog, I put my headphones in, I listen to some audiobooks, I listen to some podcasts. My two walks during the week, and I do another one on Sunday as well, so three walks a week, three 90 minute walks in nature with no inputs. Just me, the dog, and my thoughts and the world around me. And suddenly I'm noticing little bits of nature around me. I'm admiring what a wonderful, place we live in and this is you know the lockdown i've loved lockdown i mean it won't surprise you as a routine machine that i've loved doing the same thing every day and not leaving the house but exploring my local area something i never did before lockdown before lockdown i did the same few walks suddenly having to do you know having that as my only source of entertainment and the only reason to leave the house was a dog walk I discovered all these brand new paths and that one routine of just getting out and it's probably a little bit of meditation and mindfulness in there as well as exercise, as well as stepping off the treadmill of the daily grind because I'm, I do work hard in my business, but I work hard so that I don't have to work hard. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah no, I get it. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Well, look, John, it's been, Amazing to have you on the show and thank you for sharing some of your personal insights as well. Um, routine Machine, I highly recommend people go and get it. 
Um, that's obviously your second book. Um, your, your first book as well, which is Big Ideas for Small Businesses, um, is that. But um, I, I believe, I could be wrong in, in saying this, that um, you're, you're willing to make a bit of a public declaration um, <laughs> on, on this show, a world exclusive from the king of routine himself, um, about something else that's quite exciting that's happening. Absolutely. So over the last year, I have also been writing my third book. So my third book, I mentioned I was a fan of assets. My third book is called Evergreen Assets. So this is a content marketing ecosystem, which enables you to do the work once and reap the rewards again and again. So most content marketing that people put out there just doesn't work. It's far too much hard work. So this is permanent evergreen stuff that you can actually just do it once and reap the rewards again again i'm making that snowball yeah. gesture aren't i but it is that compounding it's using compounding it's using residual um impact of the marketing that you create so that you do it once and you reap it again and again so yeah that's coming out um go on i, I will i will i will publicly stick my flag in the ground and say november 25th evergreen assets is coming out there's the accountability you've said it now to all of the <laughs> listeners of make it happen with will polston and if people want to find out about that book um and and just find out more about you where can they um where, where can they go to get on mailing lists of yours or, or to find out about the book or just more about what you're up to uh, where can they find you perfect yeah so my website is bigidea.co.uk and that's got links to absolutely everything i do so you can get uh, free sample chapters of certainly the first two books um, there will be very soon uh, a free chapter of Evergreen Assets available. Um, there's also links on there to uh, my podcast, to uh, some of the blog posts that I've done as well. You'll also get my weekly emails. Now, this is something I talked about in Routine Machine, which if you are a business owner, the biggest marketing routine you can have that is the most impactful uh, over the last 20 years of running businesses for me has been a weekly email. Um, so you'll get that weekly email and that doesn't sell you anything, there's no spam on it or anything like that. Um, you'll get that one, you'll get the podcast and more information as well about kind of things like the 1% Club uh, and other lots of rants from me on there as well at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> love it love it love it love it well look john it's been an absolute pleasure having you as a guest thank you so much i've really enjoyed our conversation and uh now that we'll have you back in the not too distant future talking about the other wonderful things that you're, you're up to um so thank you very much fantastic thank you ever so much for having me Will. i've really enjoyed this you and me both well everyone listen i hope you had two i certainly have and until next time make it happen Thank you for listening to this episode of the Make It Happen with Will Polston podcast. Make sure you join Will's free Facebook group, the Make It Happen community. Please support the show by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Google Play. Share this episode with at least one friend you think would benefit from it and give Will a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. Until next time, Make it happen. Mm -hmm.